grace this conference with his presence. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the greatest son of America, excepting none, Lyndon LaRouche. than I saw firsthand 
during the 1930s. I can show you that the problem is concentrated largely among senior citizens, of which New Hampshire has a high percent of its total population. The reason is that the young people in New Hampshire got out of the state because there were no opportunities there. What had moved in of the yuppies who came in to follow the search for cheap labor by industries out of the 128 complex large I can show you a state in New Hampshire which lacks basic economic infrastructure. You, the entire New England, is now generating a peak of about 18 gigawatts of energy. The consumption under, of energy under the present conditions and cold weather up here is 18 gigawatts. The, the region is losing energy capacity through attrition. That you could not put industries up here in New Hampshire or in Northern Massachusetts to expand opportunity. The infrastructure does not exist. The energy doesn't exist. The transportation doesn't exist. The social services don't exist. The medical services, the school services, and so forth, don't exist. Like the Roman Empire, Italy, the last phase of decay before collapse, before the barbarians moved in. And I, I, I hear they're, they're gathering in Vermont. <laughs> So we are in that situation. <coughs> the United States has embarked upon a strategic policy among a president who is under the control of a friend of Arm and Hammer, i.e. his wife. <coughs> Which means that Western Europe, under present policies and trends, will become an extension of Finland at a rapid rate. Any other interpretation of the INF Treaty and Associated Agreements is absolutely absurd, even though you hear it from many sources. And anyone from Europe, from the inside who knows the situation, understands the logic of what's called the Finlandization process in Western Europe. And this great patriot, Reagan, has set this way in order. And has attempted, and is dedicated to, making that trend irreversible before he leaves office, by succeeding the INF agreement with the Star Trek, which essentially would ensure that the Soviet Empire would dominate the world irreversibly for a long time to come, beginning the 1990s. Under those conditions, the United States would become a client state of the Soviet Union, unless it resisted that status, in which case the United States would be destroyed, unless it could win a war, in isolation from its former allies in Western Europe, Japan, and so on. And the world would go under Russian conditions. And don't have any illusions about Russia. Russia is a modern caricature of the empires of Babylon of the Achaemenid Empire, of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Russia is the empire, first of all, of a master race, the great Russian race. What is called the Soviet Union is a collection of captive peoples, mostly of Turkic-speaking origins, who are subjected to third world conditions. The rates on mortality, on infant mortality and other conditions inside the Soviet Union of the Turkic population compared with those of any average third world country which we consider oppressed. This oppression is imposed by the great Russian master race of the Third Reich of Russia, Third Rome. Outside of Russia itself, we have the satrapies, the colonies of Eastern Europe, in the colonies in Bulgaria, a friend of ours was recently there, in Bulgaria, 
there is real misery. In Romania, it's worse. In Poland, it's worse. In, in East Germany, which has about the same cultural level as West of Germany, when they want to celebrate, they cover the fronts of houses with gray paint, which peels off very quickly. Is it a, why is this true in Eastern Europe? Oh, someone said it's communism, but it's, it's double talk. Okay. The reason is because that's the way the Russian Empire rules the world. It comes in, it tells its subjects, you cannot do this because you would compete with us. So you must be on a lower level than you are. We are. You must subsidize us by supplying us with what we wish to buy, which we will purchase with the credit you will give us. That is what is happening in Germany now, in the increase of East Bloc trade. All Western Europe will be subjected, if this occurs, to Eastern European rules of the game, increasing. And there are those in the United States, including friends of Adam Hammond, Hammond, Ray Andreas, and others, who are prepared to put the United States through the same process. So we stand at a point that the United States is at the verge of not only ceasing to be a world power, but of becoming, if it peaceably submits, at best, a client state on the outer fringes of the Soviet world empire. And under those conditions, there will be no development. Under Soviet world rule, the conditions of life of the so-called third world will be far worse than they are today. But the state is not only the United States as a sovereign nation, not necessarily a sovereign world empire, but a sovereign state. And what's at stake, this process continues, is the very existence of humanity. Because, as we knew many years ago, because of the simple laws of epidemiology, that if the trends and conditionalities which were set into motion between 1967 and 1972 were projected further as trends, that you could calculate the effect of these conditionalities on the per capita levels of existence in certain parts of the world. And so my friends and I did those calculations back in 1974. And on that basis, we projected that by the middle of the 1980s, several things would happen. And we focused in particular on developments in the Sahel in Africa, where we foresaw the worst effects of breakout threats. We forecast the cholera, typhoid, etc. epidemics to reach major proportions, and also predicted that a major new disease, including some kind of pandemic previously unknown to mankind would erupt as a mass planetary-wide killing during that period as a result of breakdown of economic conditions. The world Africa, for example, is being deforested. India has been deforested with the catastrophic effects on its climate. The deforestation of Africa, the same. Why the deforestation? because we don't allow them to have energy supplies for alternative kinds of food. They, the poor people cut down the trees for fuel to cook their meals. Why? Because we say appropriate technologies. Because we say you cannot have what? Energy technologies. If this continues, particularly with the HIV virus, that it's eight now known mutations, <laughs> that under these conditions of economic decline and spread of pandemic and epidemic diseases all intermingling and interacting as co-factors of what we are at the point where it is possible to project the certain extinction of the human species by some time during the first half of the next century, perhaps even the first quarter. That is a very real prospect before us. 
The only, that's, and governments are lying. World Health Organization is lying about this. They're not mistaken. There's no honest difference of opinion. They're lying. The AIDS law, what's called AIDS law, can be transmitted by any possible means that any virus can be transmitted. You simply require the right conditions, and you may have to wait a few weeks before the virus evolves or adapts itself, adapts its out of code, to find a new opportunity. If we were to fight a disease as we could, this would be spending in the United States, for example, next year, $50 billion. We'd be very rapidly an expenditure of $100 billion. We'd be within four to five years the expenditure of $200 billion annually just to fight this disease. And the Reagan administration says that to expend that kind of money in face of the current budget crisis would be contrary to the administration's economic ideology, and therefore we're going to lie because we're not going to let the people be aroused into forcing us. So we're at an existential point where the question of a new monetary system, a new economic order, is no longer a question of choice. It's no longer a question of abstract morality. It's no longer an ethical question, as we define the word ethics in vulgar use today. It is a question of whether the human race does or does not have the capability of making those decisions which constitute our species' moral fitness to continue to survive. It is not an abstract question of justice. It's a question of human survival of us all or all our grandchildren, of the coming generations. The decision will have to be made soon. For various reasons, the decision will have to be made inside the government of the United States. There is no alternative. Granted, the industrial economies of Western Europe in total represent today a significantly larger economic potential than does the United States. Japan is a much more powerful economy than any other economy in the world per capita today. And one would think that possibly if the United States <coughs> fails, some combination of Japan and Western Europe might appear, which could take the place of the United States when starting a new economic order. Politically, that's impossible. There are people in these various countries, in Japan and Western Europe, people who are very positive, people who will respond. But none of these countries has the capability of pulling together those forces in a united way sufficient to save humanity. And the Russians won't allow them. Only in the United States, in the United States government, do we have the means not, not to solve the problem as such, but the means to make certain decisions which will bring about the kind of coalition of forces needed to make the change effective. I indicate the situation. The present monetary system essentially came to an end by about 1982. I was there, I was consulting with the Reagan administration and pushing what became known a year later or so, as the SDI. In that connection, I warned the Reagan administration, the National Security Council, and other institutions, that as a result of decisions made at the end of 1981, international monetary decisions, that the external debt of the nations of South and Central America was about to blow up. With Mexico, what they had a list. I warned of that over the first six months, and then after meeting with a gentleman who should be here, but he said every world would blow up if he came here, the former president of Mexico, Lopez Patil, to a discussion of the situation, and the president and I reviewed to him what the problems were that we 
could expect the Mexican debt situation to blow up by September of that year, 1982, and that the forces in the United States were prepared to take Mexico apart piece by piece, a process which has been going on ever since, which is not completed. The next, the next big destruction of Mexico is about to occur very soon by destroying the self-destruction of the leading party of the PRI, uh, balkanizing the political processes, possibly turning the north of Mexico into a province of the Anglo-American drug pushers, who will take it over, pretty much they're trying to take over Colombia, and then divide the country and turn it into the conditions of civil war. So, I indicated that we would have to act very soon, not in the case of Mexico, but in other parts of the continent. To reverse this process, we were going to save these countries, because all of them were doomed simply, on the basis of the policies floating around the Reagan administration at that time. So as in, in that context, a friend of ours, including friends that Fred just referred to the sailor group, approached me and said that I should put my ideas into a book, a book-length manual, stating to all the people around the, particularly in Hispanic and America, all of those who agree to this, give them a working manual so that they can work together uh, to common effect around these sorts of things. So this crisis it was a very significant movement in that direction at that time. At the same time, I'm going to complete the thing, and the first of all, I presented the uh, manual to uh, the Reagan administration. About two weeks after I submitted the manual, of course, the Mexico debt crisis fell, and the entire world monetary system nearly went over the cliff in a two-hour period on the day of the Mexican announcement. The President of the United States, Reagan, called President Lopez Patil on the phone and offered to use U.S. credit to attempt uh, for the uh, United States to uh, help Mexico carry over this particular crisis that delayed the crisis. The President of Mexico, President Lopez Patil, with at that point the commitment of the President of Brazil and the uh, government of Argentina acted to implement a set of proposals identical to those which I had outlined in this report, which I had entitled Operation Juarez. There was a fight inside the Reagan administration, with people inside the National Security Council, CIA, and elsewhere, taking my side on the issue, and Henry Kissinger's friends and Kissinger associates, uh, Donald Reagan, and from outside, Walter Riston, in the New York Banking Committee, taking the opposite side. But needless to say, we lost the fight. The President of Brazil chickened out, betrayed the President of Mexico. The Argentine junta demonstrated what kind of a military leadership it represented by chickening out, betraying the President of Mexico. President Lopez Patil was left hanging out to dry, and his country was chopped to pieces, piece by piece or by bleeding over the period since, and is now at the point of virtual destruction. Compare Mexico in 1982 with Mexico today, you say here's a country which has been destroyed. Just as much as if a Nazi occupation force had occupied it during the middle of World War II. That force would have done no worse than has been done by a government which has carried out point by point nothing but the orders given to it from London, New York, and civil locations. What happened in 1982 was that Walter Riston and company, with support of some idiots, greedy idiots in Europe, who were not as stupid as Walter Riston, they said that'll destroy the United States, which he didn't understand. They said that's good. So people are getting that's good. Thanks. What happened is, as a result of that, President Reagan took action together with the New York Bank Community, which resulted in creating the biggest John Law-style financial bubble in history. That bubble kept going on. The U.S. economy collapsed. There whatever was an economic recovery in the United States. Don't believe it. The president, the president's stupid on these questions, so I can't accuse him of lying. On economics, he's insane, clinically insane, always has been. Ever since he got into political life. But he's been saying, 50, he said, 59 months of economic recovery. We had the biggest financial collapse since Black Friday in 1929. It came out the next month. 
60 months of unbroken, uninterrupted economic recovery. All this period of these 60, 62 months of so-called economic recovery since 1962 is what he dates the economic recovery. During the entirety of this period, what has happened is U.S. agriculture has collapsed. U.S. industry has collapsed. U.S. industrial employment has collapsed. The, level, the average level of real content of the per capita market basket, family market basket, has collapsed. Infrastructure has eroded and collapsed. The purchasing power of the dollar on the world market has collapsed. The president calls this recovery. He must be standing on his head to read the charts. <laughs> What grew? Yes, something grew. And he had the figures every month. Admittedly, the figures were fake. Since 1983, virtually no figure by the U.S. government has any correspondence to reality. We had a trade figure recently, completely fraudulent. We had a GNP figure, completely fraudulent this month. The government has simply made up the statistics reported as the official reports for political purposes. With no regard to what actually happened. But one thing did grow. What grew was what's called value-added from financial revenue sources, the value-added of finance. Well, when the real economy has collapsed and the nominal value of financial assets is increasing, what are you doing? This is called generating a John Law-style financial bubble. And last October, that bubble began to collapse. It is a bubble which magnitude is between 15 and 20 trillion dollars internationally. It's a financial system no one could bail it out, even though Reagan and Bush are trying. It is going to collapse. The collapse is inevitable. It is unstoppable. The reaction to this collapse is that President Reagan says, well, there is not going to be a collapse while I'm in office. I've got to go out as a man of peace. And we'll let the Russians take over afterwards, let the depression occur afterward. But let me go out as a man of peace. Let me go out and go to my death, whatever it is I've got. Let me go out with a grand illusion that the film flows. <laughs> with bonds over here. George Bush says, yeah, man. <laughs> I've got to be the next president. And I think I'd have some difficulty running as Herbert Hoover. <laughs> so keep, do anything. Sell children into slavery. Beat up 15-year-old children. Whatever you have to do to delay the crisis until after November of 1988. Then let it all hit, because I'll be president. Great fellow, man, Bush. Contrary to the image he presents as a simpering, preppy, underneath that image there is a real down to earth George Bush, a real knuckle breaker. As you saw on national television with Dan Rath, this guy thought, essentially. That's the situation. The problem the situation is worse huh, than merely the idiocies of a senile president and a George Bush will never, you'll never notice when he becomes senile because there will be no change. <laughs> his, his talents in life will hang down. That what has happened is that since the outbreak of the events in early October in New York, the President, the leadership of the Congress, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve System, the U.S. leading bankers, the leaders of the political party, and most other institutions have been doing and saying exactly what Herbert Hoover, the head of the Federal Reserve System, the head of the Treasury, Raskov, the leader of the Democratic Party, other leaders of the Congress, the New York Fed and Boston banking community did and said between 1929 and 1930. 
in Europe, except for some noises of out of France, from Balladour and Guillaume, two of the ministers in the government. What we're hearing from Europe is exactly the same policies, identical, virtually word for word, and identical in substance. The same thing that was said between 1929 and 1932. The result of this is as follows. The crisis we are in is immediately a financial crisis associated with the collapse of a gigantic financial bubble, a John Law style bubble. In the 1920s, the bubble was the hypothecation of a structure of French and German debts to the United States on the presumption of Germans' payment of the war reparations debt. When the point was reached with the young plan that it was obvious the German war reparation debt could never be paid on those terms, the markets responded to this with happy news by collapsing. However, the bubble, the Versailles bubble, which was <coughs> set off the 1929 to 1932 collapse was relatively, as well as absolutely, much smaller than the financial bubble which has been built up over the past 20 years since Johnson began to take <coughs> the system apart. Therefore, what we face is, in many respects, a repetition of the 1929 to 1931 development with two general exceptions and one special. First, the process is much deeper than during 1929-31. Secondly, the tempo of the process will be more rapid than 1929-1931, which means that at the present rate, we can expect to be in the depths of a depression much worse than 1931-1932 by sometime in 1989 at the latest. This will be the greatest catastrophe in the modern history of the United States that continues. Now, the third problem, properties. The political parties of the United States and the quality of government are vastly inferior to the quality of the political parties and government back in 1929 to and the quality of the population, generally, in terms of educational level, in terms of the stability of institutions of family life, in terms of resources to fall back on under conditions of mass unemployment, I far poorer than they were in 1929 to 1932. Therefore, we're going to have to make decisions very quickly. Because the combination of what is happening on a global scale and strategically with it, the rapidity of this crisis inside the United States means that we are at a point of irreversibility, a punct of resilience, in which we either make the necessary decisions or we can sit back on a mountaintop if we can get there and contemplate the great spectacle, the greatest of all Roman circuses, the death of the human species, or at least of civilization, as we know. And therefore, unless we can find the President of the United States, who can, as a candidate, begin to shape the events of the coming months, and could assume office in January of 1989, I think the chances humanity as a whole are grim ones for a long time to come. Now, I'll indicate the more positive side. The nature of the crisis lies not with the objective problems we face. <coughs> the crisis lies essentially with the fact that we haven't got in our governments the brains to respond to objective problems with available objective solutions. Just indicate what I would do as president on the day of inauguration. I don't think that there will be much that will change in the meantime to cause me to adopt any different measures or require any measures in addition.
addition to those I would envisage now. Not too difficult, we just brought up the list and when you were inaugurated this morning, you've got the authority to begin signing the presidential directives and setting the bill for the Congress. Under the U.S. Constitution, the, United, the President of the United States, in a certain role contributed by the, by the Congress, has adequate powers to deal with a crisis exactly like the present one, with no impairment of those liberties or the constitutional guarantees provided by, by the Constitution. In addition to the constitutional powers, particularly those under Article I of the U.S. Constitution, <coughs> the Congress, over a period of time, has given the President emergency legislation chiefly grouped around the Federal Emergency Management Agency Acts, the agency itself of the Acts of the Social <coughs> Many of these proposals by the Congress are bad, the bad legislation. But nonetheless, they're on the books. And the president who has the brains to do so can pick from this legislation, simply by declaring a national economic policy, can pick a menu of actions which coincide with exactly what has to be done. The president can, in effect, seize the Federal Reserve System, discontinue those practices of the Federal Reserve to which he objects convert the Federal Reserve System into a system of national banks, modeled upon the first bank of the United States under Washington, or the second bank under Monroe and John Quincy Adams. In addition to those measures are the use of regulatory powers of government, exchange controls, capital flight controls, import-export controls, regulation of banks which are in trouble to make sure they don't close their doors, Regulatory actions to defend the value of the U.S. dollar on world markets. Regulatory action to protect the value of U.S. government debt in the form of bonds <coughs> and U.S. Treasury bills and evaluation. The main thing the President has to do is to know how to use a provision of our Constitution, which has been not much observed in recent decades. Under our Constitution, the creation of the U.S. currency occurs by the, a bill presented to the Congress for its deliberation and action by the President. This bill, when passed, when enacted, authorizes the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury to issue a certain quantity of U.S. Treasury currency notes as currency. Now, what will be required over the coming two years in the United States to deal primarily with the domestic requirements of the United States is about two trillion dollars a year in issue of U.S. Treasury currency notes. These notes would be lent through a the Federal Reserve system, banks, which would be functioning as national banks. These banks, in turn, would usually lend these notes to federal, state, and local agencies for capital improvements and infrastructure, to public utilities for capital improvements and infrastructure, for farm <coughs> production loans and capital improvements and agriculture, for industrial production loans and capital improvements and industry or expansion and industry, and for long-term to medium-term export financing of product by U.S. exports to foreign countries. An intelligent application of these funds would limit their application to these categories. That is, if you wish to go into the insurance business, you couldn't borrow this kind of money. If you wish to set up a casino, by no means you borrow this kind of money. The important thing is to make sure that the flow of these funds does not go into administrative sales, financial services, overhead of the economy, <coughs> except in the professional and scientific grades of services but goes entirely into expanding the labor force in, of operatives and their productivity. To give an indication of the effect of this, an increase, even without any significant increase in technology, an increase of the number of industrial and operatives, that's both infrastructure and industry, employed, say during a three to four year period in the United States would increase the per capita physical output of the United States by between 20 and 25 percent. In point of fact, the technology we have, we'd be obliged to use 
would be closer to 30 to 35 percent. Now, there is very little that you could fix in the United States if you started from an increase of total output of about 35 percent per capita. There is no budget that couldn't be balanced, and so on. Now, to put, take this and put this in the context of international economic and monetary reform. The Bretton Woods system and, and its, and its uh, zombie relic, its Dracula relic called the floating exchange rate system. That is, they kill the uh, floating rate, they kill the old Bretton Woods system and they brought it back as a walking corpse which walks at night and sucks the bloods of nations. The floating exchange rate system. That thing just has to be scrapped. It's a very simple thing to scrap it. It's a creation of treaty agreements of governments. If governments abrogate those treaty agreements, or alter them, it simply ceases to exist. The IMF can sit there, it can vibrate, it can oscillate, but it just sits there, same with the World Bank. That the authority, monetary system has to be based on the authority of sovereign governments. It is effectively, effectively a trade organization among sovereign governments and has no legitimate authority except as a treaty organization of sovereign governments as partners. Therefore, what we simply do is we take the old monetary system, put it to one side, put it in the closet, and, and open the closet to horrify children on, on Halloween. <laughs> we sort it out later. What, the question is, how do we generate growth? Well, the first thing that has to happen is this president, I would have to have most of the so-called third world leaders as in the capacity of preferably of either presidents or prime ministers or foreign ministers or some combination of both. both. Me, instead of my dancing, which I don't do on the inauguration ball, <laughs> and I might not take that up at my age, particularly without 10 off the surgeons, you know, <laughs> we'd have to meet and settle immediately question of restructuring and reorganization of debt of these nations as far as involved the United States. Well, if the United States government signs a memorandum of agreement to such effect, simply a signature on a memorandum of agreement is effectively a treaty with the president and the issue is a presidential directive of an emergency, and then pass it as, as a pleasure down to Congress to be treated as a treaty and make a treaty law. But the president can do a great number of things under emergency conditions in this form. Now, once the United States government, once the president of the United States has entered into such an agreement with a group of developing nations on restructuring and reorganization of their external debt and expansion of their import capacity and conditions of new volumes of loans for economic development, well, the rest of the world just has to go along with it. And there we can be assured that the forces in Japan which agree with this kind of policy would join with it immediately, and they would become predominant in Japan, as opposed to others who uh, tend to be more pro monetarist That in Western Europe, the forces typified by the, the statements of Balladur, French Minister Balladur, Guillaume, would become predominant. The crazies in Israel would simply have to go and find themselves on the new uh, promised land on the moon, and the same one would uh, accept what we call the Marshall Plan for collaboration with their Arab neighbors under this basis. Of course, the developing countries wouldn't be much of a trouble. We might have trouble with, with Khomeini, but I don't think he's going to be around too much longer. <clears throat> on the basis of that, the United States, of course, would enter into matching agreements with our friends in the OECD nations. And thus, we would have, in effect, the basis for a new monetary system simply by these kinds of agreements. What would make it a monetary system would be the agreement of the other countries, the Western European countries and others, to agree to create credit, not for money loans. I don't think that lending money does any good, it just leads to usury. What should be lent are strictly lines of credit, short term, medium term, long-term credit. There's no sense in the United States government or any banks running around giving countries money. It 
doesn't do any good and usually does a great deal of harm. The money rarely somehow disappears in the Swiss banks on the way into the development project in most cases, <coughs> not into the country. Give these countries lines of credit for their infrastructure, <laughs> agricultural, and industrial development projects, including such things as health programs and educational systems under infrastructure. Supply them what they need. Give them the means they, they require to employ vast armies of unemployed labor or misemployed labor. But in general, in my opinion, from looking at many developing projects in developing sectors, that most developing countries could undertake most large-scale development projects using 80% domestic resources. That the, what they require from foreign countries is essentially certain crucial included elements of the project which amount to about anywhere from 5% 20% of the total package. The trick is, is to enable countries to survive on their own resources, to give them the ability to mobilize their labor, to give them the ability to lay the basis for their own development as sovereign states. And we can do that. It's no mystery for those of us who are economists, given the business economy, and I suppose I can do a pretty good job right here if you want to take the time to do it, to run off a list of major infrastructural development projects which would transform this planet. These infrastructural projects would create the domestic markets in the countries they affected for the growth and development of agriculture and industry. It would mean new industries. It would mean increase in food supplies would come automatically. Railroad projects. We have now better railroads. We have the magnetic levitation trains that we have the power to run them, which are cheaper, better, cheaper to maintain, cheaper to build, which can run at speeds of three to four hundred miles an hour. You have to run them that speed. Railroads, water management projects, both for transportation, better utilization of water for general purposes and agriculture, and control of the environment. And above all, production of power. We know there's no, there's no escape from power production, and despite some people's sensibility, there's no escape from nuclear power production. There is no alternative. And look at the deforestation of Africa and India, and you see the fact. Or look at India, which, how does it power its economy? It takes coal, runs it from the mines of the north down to the cities of India, and the movement of tons of coal by freight car is destroying the Indian railway system. Without nuclear energy, India is doomed. It's not a matter of choice. There is no alternative. Yes, there's great hydroelectric potential. But hydroelectric projects properly managed give you very little net energy. Because if you manage them properly, you use as much energy to maintain the system properly as you do as you get from it. Or if you get power from it, you cannot control at will the time you get the power from it. You have only certain parts of the year in certain conditions in which you get a significant net power production. We don't have fusion power yet. We should have it. We don't. So therefore, and in this area, you can measure this. You can measure it with all the figures from the history, economic history of mankind. The level of productivity and income of a population is a function of the density of usable energy supplied per person and per square kilometer. The difference between India and a developing country, or other developing countries, Japan, North America, Europe today, is infrastructure measured in power. There is no development without infrastructure. It's impossible. It's a physical impossibility. Someone says we're going to develop our industries and our agriculture rather than infrastructure. They don't understand economics. It's impossible. 
This is, you can measure this in calories. Measure this in kilowatts. The number of kilowatts of infrastructure consumption of energy per person and per square kilometer determines absolute and upper limits of economic development in terms of uh, per capita productivity and consumption. If you don't have that development, you are doomed to a level of development which coincides with the amount of energy per capita per square kilometer you have. Now in those terms, water projects some reforestation projects, transportation projects, including rail, particularly in water management, power, and other infrastructures such as health systems, school systems, the development of new kinds of cities which are cheaper to maintain, more durable, these kinds of projects. This is what the world needs. It really doesn't need to think about much else. The other rest of it's easy. Once you have the infrastructure, then it's very easy to determine what industries you want to put on infrastructure. Industries are like electrical devices that you plug in the wall. They work if you have the plug, the electricity supply, into which to plug. In this case, the infrastructure supply. Now, this is beneficial to both of our parties, the developing and developed sector. <coughs> Again, our economic policy in Europe and the United States and Japan, or particularly Europe and the United States, over the past 20 years, has been clinically insane. A healthy development of the economy starts by decreasing the percentage of the total labor force required in rural production to increase urban production. Now, unless you get too many salesmen, bankers, clerks, uh, shoeshine people, and so forth, that, that's insane. But as long as you keep the amount of administration, financial, low-grade service, and so forth, labor to a minimum, keep your number of parasites to a minimum, you can have one parasite in the zoo to abuse the children. But generally, keep your parasites to a minimum, particularly the ones that get very rich. And then the urban industries grow, as Hamilton laid out, the urban industries grow on the basis of the a healthy in relationship between the urban community as a manufacturing community primarily and rural production. Urban development depends upon growth, movement away from consumer goods production into capital goods production. And in terms of these ratios and the level of energy development per capita and per square kilometer, you can measure the absolute viability of economies without knowing a thing about prices, without knowing a thing about money prices. In the United States, we've been insane. We were insane throughout the entire post-war period. The so-called Eisenhower recovery was a piece of insanity, which lasted three years and came to a screeching halt in 1957-58. What? Eisenhower had the theory of it from Burns that you had to have, you had a trickle up economy. If you would use consumer credit to expand automobile sales, everything would be good. Insane. Insane economics, which ruined us during the late 1950s. The trick in economy is to put the credit into the expansion of the capital goods sector, which throws off and generates technology. The demand created by the capital goods sector creates the basis for the growth of the consumer goods sector. Then that's how you maintain full employment in an economy, is by expanding capital goods investment and employment to absorb as much as possible of your whole labor force. The United States, we've done the honest. Our machine tool industry is almost non-existent. We've destroyed our producers' goods industries generally. The steel industry not, doesn't exist. We say we can get steel cheaper by stealing it from Peru or from Mexico. We can get food cheaper than from our farmers by stealing it from countries that are hungry or where there is vast hunger, such as Brazil. This is President Reagan's economic. What is beneficial to the developing and industrialized, so-called industrialized countries, is to eliminate as much as possible all export of consumer goods, except absolutely indispensable goods such as what we would need, in the developing nations, and almost to make a law against it, or 
or to use regulation of export import regulation to prevent this from occurring. We don't wish any cosmetics going from the United States to Africa. It just make the Africans look ugly. <laughs> I see no point in that. Um, our people in the United States are ugly enough already. You see men running around with these cosmetics? It's terrible. <laughs> What we wish to export and should wish to export are essentially two things. It's sometimes called technology transfer. Capital goods and certain specialized qualities of engineering services. That's all the United States should ever desire to commit itself to exporting to developing nations. Because if we increase the rate of development in developing nations, we have two effects. First of all, we increase the turnover of our capital goods industry simply by more sales. And by increasing the turnover of the capital goods industry, you actually cause economic growth in the United States. Simply by export. Even before you get money back on the, on the goods export. Secondly, by increasing the per capita productivity in the developing countries, what we're doing fine, we're, we're letting our customers grow. Now, the United States is insane. They believe today that the best way to build your market is by killing your customers, <laughs> which is what they've done with the developing sector with monetary policy. The intelligent policy is to do the opposite. What we have to reach agreement on to create a monetary system is to get the United States, Japan, and Western Europe, or most of the nations, to agree on a new basis for pegging currencies to fix prices going back to a gold reserve standard for that purpose, to issue credit at agreed terms of credit, to have a schedule of priorities on issuance of credit, and to have regular meetings among various countries, developing and industrialized, to set priorities and goals for imports, exports, and investments. <coughs> So that what governments will do as a result of those agreements is governments such as the government of the United States will simply, its export, import bank, and other institutions will simply allot every year for export <coughs> purposes, export credit purposes, a certain percent of a total amount of lending power to each of the debt crisis by country or by nation. The way we show operate, the United States will become a major exporting nation again. Everything else is insane. Instead of the United States, Japan, and the United uh, Western Europe trying to take in each other's laundry by selling to each other across the fence, across the back fence, the Japan and Western Europe will be told no more except in very specialized categories of, such as spaghetti, pasta, good European wine, and so on. We only have that in the U.S. population. But in the high ticket items of consumer goods, Get out of it. The United States is not going to be your market anymore for these kinds of consumer goods. You're going to direct your investment and production into providing capital goods for the developing sector. And you, Japan, we, the United States, and other countries will come to agreed terms on sharing that market's potential with the consent of developing nations. And what we're going to export is capital. You know, to rebuild this plan. Perfectly feasible <coughs> proposition. It all hangs, of course, on getting, making sure the next president of the United States does that. But we have two choices. Either we don't do that, in which case you can write off the increase. Not necessarily extinct, that could be possible, but you can write off civilization as we've known it for a long time. We are now at the Pumpkin's Alliance. The next 12 months or so. That's the point of Zalman. If it isn't done, then it will never happen. At least not within foreseeable generations. That's the only thing that can. So that's the only thing we can allow to happen. Now, as to what will happen, I don't think we, at this conference, or others around the world who share our concerns, should worry in the least of whether what we desire to happen will happen or not. That is not our power to determine. We'll do the best we can to make sure that we don't have the power to determine that. We cannot ensure that the bonus of the United States will be safe. 
a matter of fact, in their recent pattern of choices in the post-war period, we find that they tend to be the contrary. They, they, they elected as a parade, a prize in of the 20th century. These are men who were mediocrity by uh, training or agreed to be such for the privilege of enjoying the pomp and circumstance of holding the office. As long as they did nothing in office, they were allowed to be president. Jerry Ford is an example of that. The man who had no idea what it meant to be president, but he sure liked the pomp and circumstance. <laughs> and as long as they didn't bother to do the too many decisions, he could just go around and be absolutely happy on the airplane, with all the protection, and all the things he got on that. His wife liked it too. <laughs> but we, the, but it, we cannot, we don't control it. We cannot, facing a problem of this nature, the fate of humanity, we cannot say, well, we will do something about the fate of humanity if you will assure us that the American borders are going to behave intelligently this year. Well, that seems immoral to me. My view is that we must do what is necessary. <coughs> we cannot associate ourselves morally with any enterprise except that which is necessary for humanity. Therefore, win and lose, win or lose, let us dedicate all of our exertions to the maximum degree, to the only thing worth doing. Not dependent upon whether we can guarantee success or not. I would rather die having failed at doing the only thing worth doing than die succeeding in contributing, supporting, or tolerating the catastrophe which otherwise is going to befall mankind. The prospect of my becoming president is a highly speculative one, but I think I might just do it. <laughs> because of the nature of the times, in crises, all kinds of strange things are better or worse happen. The prospect of finding some other candidate who might be elected who would do it is virtually zilch, zero. We have none of the visible candidates who do anything but the opposite of what I've outlined. Apart from Gary Hart's being saying nice things about the third world and being nicer to him, that's like Lady uh, Do Rightly handing out uh, doggies to the poor in her back door twice a week for an hour at a time. That kind, that these are the kinds of things that make charity a disgusting word. Most of them are evil. Dole's program is evil. Bush will be evil. Most of the Democrats will be evil. None will be evil. Cuomo will be much more evil. He'd not only steal from him and send a racket to him that I was taken from him. He was mafia president. Bradley's a rogue scholar. We well, did not spread about that, what that means. <laughs> He's, he's, he's a very famous face, his actress armpit when he was playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very unlikely. So the, the humanity, the future of humanity seems to be a very unlikely prospect. But as I say, we can put ourselves and our efforts to the only thing worth doing. Nothing else is worth doing. <coughs> Do it right. Face each of the problems involved, both the technical economic problems and also the political problems of affecting the terms of collaboration among nations which both meet the requirements of respect for their sovereignty and also <coughs> respect for the fact that their sensibilities may be different than those of some of the rest of us. We must bring these nations together. We must bring them together on an equitable basis. We must bring them together on a basis of respect for their sovereignties. And we must bring them together with the idea that what we agree to do is not something that's going to be served on paper, passed off to special study commissions. Those are wonderful things, those study commissions. 
When a government says it wants to appear to do the right thing without ever having to do it, it creates a study commission, a feasibility study. When I hear a feasibility study, oh, we've decided to support that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we're putting on a feasibility study. Ah, you mean you're, you're not going to do it, but you want people to, you want people to be able to accuse you of not doing it. Everything that has to be done of importance we can do right now without any feasibility studies. <laughs> so maybe the first plank is it's against the international law to organize a feasibility study. <laughs> it might be a great boom to come. You would force a great number of politicians and governments to put their mouths up or shut up. So we must come we must come to those kinds of, deal with those kinds of problems. We must also, in doing that, understand the importance, particularly of developing nations, to developing nations, of a sense of full participation as sovereign and equal nations in the process of deliberations that we propose. Nations must be induced to participate in formulating the kinds of policies we wish for new economic growth. Economic not simply stand at the back door and wait for somebody to hand it out to them as a finished product. So I say despite the difficulties, despite the problem of these buildings I'm going to give, the problem is a slightly one. We have the knowledge and means to solve the problem. We face the difficulties, the political and diplomatic related difficulties of coming to an agreed form of solution in detail that the solution in principle should be readily available. Right People may ridicule us and say, well, why are you doing that? You have no assurance that that will ever come about. And our answer is, it's the only worth thing worth trying to bring about. Friend of Armand Hammer, 
i.e. his wife. <coughs> Which means that Western Europe, under present policies and trends, will become an extension of Finland at a rapid rate. Any other interpretation of the INF Treaty and Associate Agreements is absolutely absurd, even though you hear it from many sources. And anyone from Europe, from the inside, who knows the situation, understands the logic of what's called the Finlandization process in Western Europe. And this great patriot, Reagan, has set this point in order and has attempted and is dedicated to making that trend irreversible before he leaves office by succeeding the INF agreement with the Star Trek, which essentially would ensure that the Soviet Empire would dominate the world irreversibly for a long time to come, beginning in the 1990s. Under those conditions, the United States would become a client state of the Soviet Union, unless it resisted that status, in which case the United States would be destroyed, unless it could win a war, in isolation from its former allies in Western Europe, Japan, and so on. And the world would go under Russian conditions. And don't have any illusions about Russia. Russia is a modern caricature of the empires of Babylon of the Achaemenid Empire, of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Russia is the empire, first of all, of a master race. Grace this conference with his presence. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the greatest son of America, excepting none, Lyndon LaRouche. Satrapies, 
the colonies of Eastern Europe. In the colonies of Bulgaria, a friend of ours was recently there, in Bulgaria, there is real misery. In Romania, it's worse. In Poland, it's worse. In, in East Germany, which has about the same cultural level as Western Germany, when they want to celebrate, they cover the fronts of houses with gray paint, which peels off very quickly. Is it a, why is this true in Eastern Europe? Oh, someone said it's communism, but that's, that's double talk. Okay. The reason is because that's the way the Russian Empire rules the world. It comes in, it tells its subjects, you cannot do this because you would compete with us. So you must be on a lower level than you are. We are. You must subsidize us by supplying us with what we wish to buy, which we will purchase with the credit you will give us. That is what is happening in Germany now, in the increase of East Bloc trade. All Western Europe will be subjected, if this occurs, to Eastern European rules of the game, increasing. And there are those in the United States who be friends of Adam Hammond to sustain the acquisition of one house recently constructed which shall not outlive the mortgage. <laughs> that is not in my view of prosperity. I can show you the majority of the population of Hampshire is objectively in worse economic condition today than I saw firsthand during the 1930s. I can show you that the problem is concentrated largely among senior citizens, of which New Hampshire has a high percentage of its total population. The reason is that the young people in New Hampshire got out of the state because there were no opportunities there. What had moved in of the young people came in to follow the search for cheap labor by industries out of the 128 complex large I can show you a state in New Hampshire, which lacks basic economic infrastructure. You, the entire New England, is now generating a peak of about 18 gigawatts of energy. The consumption under, of energy under the present conditions and cold weather up here is 18 gigawatts. The, the region is losing energy capacity through attrition that you could not put industries up here in New Hampshire or in Northern Massachusetts to expand opportunity. The infrastructure does not exist. The energy doesn't exist. The transportation doesn't exist. The social services don't exist. The medical services, the school services, and so forth don't exist. like the Roman Empire, Italy, the last phase of decay before collapse, before the barbarians moved in. I, I hear they're, they're gathering in from 